Nous allons parler des interactions entre les humains et la nature, l'évolution du monde. And I shall start by discussing a few specific ecosystems. Here in the top right-hand corner, a piece of the ocean, it's coral. This is uh, the Great Reef in uh, New Caledonia, in the Pacific Ocean, which is one of the richest uh, ecosystems, five to six species in, in square kilometers. Here in the bottom, a tropical rainforest in South America, in French Guyana, with about 50,000 species per square kilometer. So these are very, very rich in species per square meter. And, and quite a special case here in the top left-hand corner, Shanghai, Almost half of the French population lives in this particular system. And humans have brought this uh, wild nature towards the town. And this is an image of the temperature of the world, which is on the rise. Of course, the climate has always changed, as everyone says. It has helped and assisted biodiversity very much, but it is rising too fast, which creates a number of constraints, as we're going to discuss in the next few minutes. So within global change, everything is interconnected. There's energy, of course. What energy? What influence on life, on biodiversity? We're going to discuss the climate, the interaction between climate and biodiversity, pollution, it's uh, the great ill of uh, the last few centuries, and this one too, and the interactions between humans and non-humans and nature. We have two pictures here, a system that is lifeless, the lava volcanoes, but apart from that, life is everywhere on Earth. Uh, there are bacteria in the deep ocean, in deep rock pockets, in soil, in the ocean. And here, elephants who are taking refuge in this area of the world because they know it's easier to live there. In Okavango, uh, Okavango now shelters half of the world's elephants. And then four images here. Bacteria, the origins of life, small marine algae, dinoflagellae, a small tardigrade, I like him, a tiny little animal, it's about half and 1.5 millimeters. It's incredibly resilient. And in the lower right-hand corner, an image uh, in my life. We were in Madagascar, in Machanga, in a Lima reservation uh, that is operated by the museum. And there are families there, a few women, a few men, a few children. We asked them what they were doing here. And they told us a terrible story. They walked from Tulia, several uh, 100 kilometers, 800 kilometers, because they were thrown out, because there are no trees, no agriculture, nothing to eat. And every day they were thrown out, and they came to our Lima reservation, and the Limas said nothing. And they said, it's very cruel. If we keep these Limas with us, the more we talk to them, the more we like them, or we hunt them, and it's tough. It's a very a beautiful metaphor of our relationship, of the relationship between... Uh, humans and animals. And in January 2013, when he was brought into the, accepted into uh, the Royal Academy, he said, can we avoid the crumbling of our civilizations? We always imagine this when we talk about biodiversity. This is a fragment of a beach in Guadeloupe in May 2012. There are micro crustaceans in the sand. It's biodiversity. But it's not just that, because biodiversity is much more complex than that. Biodiversity, to me, is this. It's all of the relationships that all living beings have established between themselves and with their environment. And here, if I remove the nickel of the forks and the glass of the glass, um, everything is alive. There's yeast, bacteria. Uh, fungus, and what would a Frenchman be without bread, wine, and cheese? And in fact, the humans have chosen just a small number of species. Um, some of them have become hugely populous on the earth. There's 1.4 billion cows. 
in terms of biomass are heavier than humans. Of course, it creates problems, and there are civilizations in Madagascar or India where people have cows but do not eat them. There are three ecosystems to discuss that I'm going to show you to discuss biodiversity. It's much more interesting to talk about species. A drop of seawater, a lot of uh, experimentation has been conducted. Tara Ocean brings us a lot of samples. Um, in a single drop of water, there are hundreds of uh, thousands of microalgae, millions of bacteria, and billions of viruses. And since the origin of life, it's always been like this. Life appeared on Earth about uh, 400, 4,000 uh, million years ago. And uh, the drop of water is the same all over the ocean. 13% of all known species, about 250,000, that's the 2 million that are known today. Second ecosystem a fragment of soil. Wherever you are on the earth, the soil contains 2.5 tons of bacteria per hectare. Uh, this tardigrade, uh, nematode, columbone. It accounts for about twice as many species as exist in the ocean. And modern agriculture, with all of these poisons, has killed about half of the world's soil. And we will need to feed 9 billion humans. And then my third ecosystem, which is rather strange, is what is that? It's the intestine of a human baby at birth in a human body. On the surface and inside there are at least as many bacteria. I took a lot of interest at the point in which a human baby makes contact with the earth. It's when um, the mother loses the water and bacteria from the tractus are then going to contaminate the baby. Uh, and it takes two years for a human baby to stabilize his intestinal flora. And we know that that is changing. 300 new diseases in France since the 1940s, and a great many of them uh, are related to the fact that the bacteria has changed because of diet and all because of excessive use of antibiotics. So this is the same picture of the baby's intestine with the Tara Océan expedition. And on the left here, genes that exist only in marine plankton, and in red, orange, genes of the baby. One third of our genes are common between the vegetal cells of phytoplankton and the human baby at birth. So we have examined very closely the relationship between bacteria in the ocean and bacteria in a human baby's belly. Gut it means that humans are deeply fit in nature. We only eat biological foods. We cooperate with other biological units. So we are deeply imbricated with nature. And humans, of course, have a little ocean uh, with uh, three times less salt than the Atlantic Ocean. So when did humans start to separate from nature? Domestication of fire about 1.5 million years ago. This allowed humans to keep uh, large predators at bay. It allowed them also to leave Africa, to harden their tools and weapons, and later to cook meat. Um, and when you eat meat that was killed by lions uh, 10 days ago, it's better to cook it. The second phase is the Neolithic. Only Homo sapiens remains on Earth. Homo erectus had domesticated fire. So about between eight and 14,000 years ago, uh, domestication of animals, women have a lot of babies, and then agriculture, and then very powerful impacts on the environment. The third key date is the invention of the steam engine. Here it's horse, moving from horses to horsepower. And another date I find very interesting is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's the first time that human knowledge creates something that is the same order of scales as a huge natural disaster. And it's also the time when demographic explosion happens. There were 2.5 billion humans, and that's been multiplied by three and it will be, have been multiplied by four in less than a century, which is huge, of course. And the final comment is uh, the proposition by um, 
a medicine uh, peace prize to uh, peace prize to call it the Anthropocene. In fact, now the greatest driver of evolution is no longer salinity of the ocean or the length of the day. It's the presence of humans with everything that I talked about before. It could, we could say it starts at the Neolithic or with the steam engine or uh, much more recently with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And humans evolved technically. It's the Homo Faber. Uh, Dominique Bourg uses this and Edgar, Edgar Morin. Men know how to make. Uh, you uh, listen to the radio, you watch television, you have a wristwatch. And all of the events that are going to allow humans to achieve this are, are created by techniques. The first one is the biface, the, uh, um, the cut. Uh, scraper, the stone scraper that uh, the first humans use. And then it was the uh, propulsion of a spear that you would throw or bows and arrows, which kept you at a safe distance from a predator. If you have to kill a rhinoceros or a wild, or a wild pig using a stone scraper, it's very tough. Now I see kids age 15 who kill elephants with Kalashnikovs, you have to measure this domination that humans believe they hold uh, over uh, the animal realm. And then the invention of the wheel will allow them to transport heavy loads over long uh, distances. So the invention of metal, the invention of vaccines, and then of aircraft and computers, all of this explains the huge boom in human capacity to try and imagine a, a world domina domination, a planetary domination, and biodiversity today is under threat because there are issues of destructions of ecosystems or of pollution, pervasive pollution, also issues of over-exploitation of resources, a look at um, fishing in the oceans or tropical forests, the dissemination of everything all over. This is the dinoflagelli. Uh, traveling all over the world, um, and it can produce a toxin that can kill a human in 20 minutes called Alexandrium, and here microalgae in uh, uh, the uh, Black Sea, which have destroyed uh, the fish stock. And then finally, the climate, which is changing, and that explains what is happening. But it, it is superimposed on what we're continuing to do, to destroy, to pollute, to disseminate, and to over-exploit, which brings us to the seven plagues of the ecologic crisis, a crisis in agricultural productivism. We can do things differently without poisoning people, lack of drinking water, we are made of uh, three quarters of water, our brain 80%. Water is, more, is more, even more essential than DNA. Fishing is great. Overfishing is stupid. We can stop. We know how to do it. Deforestation. Why don't we stop cutting down these tropical forests that are disappearing at the rate of the surface of the UK every year? Biodiversity is crumbling. It's vital. We are consuming it. We live through biodiversity. What would the economy, including the French economy, be without biodiversity? Tourism, gastronomy, cosmetics. Biodiversity is vital for us and the toxicity of products that we are disseminating all over. We are poisoning each other with new diseases created through soil pollution, water pollution, the pollution of the oceans, or atmospheric pollution. All of this can be managed if humans use techniques to improve technology. The only one where it's too late is climate change. We had to take care of that before. Now, what we need to do is try and mitigate the damage. We've already gained 0.85 degree. We mustn't go beyond 1.5 degrees. It's, of course, the great challenge of today's international accords. And in future, of course, agriculture. And it's true that feeding 9 billion human beings without wasting water, without poisoning people, without increasing um, farming land indefinitely, and use polyculture in with much greater harmony with the soil. So real research programs need to be developed from the farming world with, of course, the farmers themselves, 
uh, who do who have no desire to poison other humans. It's a quite an issue of organization of the system, and we can really do that, including in our regions. In the marine world, it's the same thing. Look, this is a picture by my friend Philippe Curie that shows that overfishing results in a destruction of the birds who consume them, or uh, fish uh, who are on the other end of the food chain. If these pelagic fish disappear, zooplankton is no longer consumed. It consumes all of the phytoplankton, and the ocean dies. The living ocean, of course, plays a key role in fixating uh, CO2. And if it is dead, it can no longer play its role in regulating the climate. So the effects of climate change, what is that reflected in? The temperature of the air and the ocean, very clearly. Uh, glaciers are melting. In South America, the glaciers are melting much faster than European glaciers. South America has lost, in 60 years, what we took three centuries to lose. Uh, tropical hurricanes are increasingly violent and uh, frequent. Uh, droughts, floods, long, longer, increasingly long droughts. After nine months of droughts, you get a few days of intense rain, and that's dramatic for farming. If there is no farming, what do humans do? They leave, they migrate. It's also the drop in the proportion of oxygen in water, and it's also uh, the rise in the sea level. 55% of humans live by the seaside. Try and think of major cities that are not near the ocean. The ocean fixates CO2, but the counterpart of that is that it produces carbon acid that acidifies the oceans, and that's a great problem for coral growth or seashells. The rise in the sea level, initially, uh, 19,000 years ago, wherever you were, the water was 125 meters lower and the temperature four degrees lower. So it started rising about 19,000 years ago and uh, rose very quickly for about 10,000 years and then stabilized for the past 5,000 years. And with climate change, now it's on the rise again. 6.5 centimeters since 1992, which is huge. The ocean is rising three times faster than it did 30 years ago. And you can see here the acidification. And these buildings here, it's uh, in France, threatened by the uh, direct rise in water, temper in water levels. So an aspect that is very often overlooked, but that is hugely important, is the relationship between climate change, the crumbling of biodiversity, and diseases which humans uh, are catching. 300 new diseases since 1940 with uh, man-made origins. Aging, of course, we live longer. Exposure to the sun, skin cancer. Air pollution that kill a thousand people a day in China today. Atmospheric pollution, but also soil and water pollution. And bacterial and viral infections, which are re-emerging or uh, appearing, then the autoimmune diseases, thyroid, and there really is a relationship with climate change and with the lack of diversity. The metabolic risk increases with temperature. And this should lead us to think about the fact that these diseases over regenerate and have since the late 70s. And then, of course, new diseases, uh, AIDS, hepatitis, and all of this places humans in... Uh, uh, great risk of exposure to these. But the major risk, of course, is poverty. Sustainable development cannot happen without eradication of poverty and of the diseases associated with poverty. So what can an ecologist do? You must think about these disturbances of the ecosystems. On this graph here on the left, you have the resistance, the resilience of the ecosystems. A, a river, a forest, a prairie, what have you. If you destroy it, it's over. In order to be resilient, to return to one's original state, you at least need to have survived. And if you're not entirely destroyed, you need resilience. And we need to be able to forecast these evolutions. These are bees. They're a great indicator of... Uh, uh, of this. And to the right, you have uh, these uh, marine jellyfish that are invading the ocean. 
So I would like to talk about Edgar Morin, who wrote this book with uh, Patrick Vivray, How to Live in Times of Crisis. He said, uh, the Earth is a spaceship with four engines, uh, the uh, explosion engine, science, technique, the economy, and profit. And each of these engines, these drivers, can be highly beneficial, also very dangerous for humankind. We need to start thinking about this properly. And Edgar Morin says, of course, I'm not a catastrophist. He says, the probable is catastrophic. We are walking towards a deep chasm. But he says, look at the situation today. There has always been improbability. The future is never played in advance. And we all need to become aware, but we need to start acting right now. And in fact, the characteristic of metamorphosis that humankind needs is that, like any creation, it is not predictable. What we need is awareness. We need a planetary human awareness, not just our own ethnic groups, and this is where scientists say horrible things, where we forget or set aside a great part of humankind. And when we look at that, we say we are homo faber, we are homo demens, but we are still not homo sapiens. And that is why we need to struggle to become sapiens in the 21st century. And I will now discuss Sri Aurobindo, a great Indian thinker who in 1915, before environmentalism even existed, said that men create so many disturbances in their environment that the, this gigantic development of life outside cannot change without a challenge within humans. And if we wish to survive, we need a radical transformation of human nature. That is a prerequisite. And if I pick up on that, we're going to be connecting basic science to observations and philosophy. And it's very important to connect science and human sciences to the hard science, to uh, various developmental sciences. Otherwise, that's how things can end. These are forecasts of uh, uh, the European Union about uh, loss of biodiversity caused by global warming that says that if we fail to take all of this into account, it will result in huge migration of flora, of fauna, fish migrates, but also of humans. And it has already started. 11% of wars are currently triggered because of uh, climate change. Lake Chad is drying out. It's a disaster. The war in Syria follows the 12 worst years of drought ever known in the Fertile Crescent in the past 300 years. So this is not wacky environmentalism. These are things that are absolutely essential for the future of humankind. We all need to make a commitment to change. We will be unable to adapt if we refuse to change. Uh, corporations need to play a part, cities, regions, we need to create jobs, we need to enjoy living in our regions. Um, we need to be in a position to stay where we live without destroying the environment, with much greater harmony than what we're doing now. We live in cities now. We need a different economy based not on destruction of nature or its over-exploitation. It's, uh, and that requires deep change. And uh, businesses need to be preserved. I mean, we have relationships with businesses a lot, and uh, regions, cities, businesses need to evolve, need to change within a broader framework of international change. And this is an image. This is this was the end of the Paris Accords in December 2015. Chairman Fabius and Mr. Ban Ki Moon announced that the Paris Accord is successful, 195 countries, diplomatic success, also uh, a great success for humanity. But we also need to have questions about what happens next. And let me finish with a picture of a highly emotional uh, moment. Uh, it was the time when we logged on in this uh, uh, great room in, I think it was day two of December 2nd or 4th, 2015, and we spoke with the International Space Station. And there were two cosmonauts there, an American and a Russian. And what did they say? It was a highly emotional moment. They said, you are discussing the future of the Earth. And then, of course, the Paris Accords on April 22nd, 2016, in the UN, we decided to ratify the Paris Accords, which were ratified and uh, which came into force on November 4th, 2016. And they said, these cosmonauts said, what you're doing is important. We have a little window 
And through this little window, porthole, we can see the entire earth with its blue oceans. We see the forests of Indonesia burning. We see the cloud of pollution hovering over China. We see pollution in the Gulf of Mexico. And we see Africa becoming a desert. So hurry up. Dépêchez-vous.